and welcome back this is the second video of the Viking turbo engine installation and we're going to install it or show the installation in this Zenith Super Duty today we'll talk about things like the cowling installation the intercooler the batteries battery cables electrical and instrumentation so let's get to it let's uh, take a look at that cowling up front the cowling on the Super Duty housing the turbocharged engine is similar to the one that has the air-cooled engine in the factory uh, Zenith demonstrator for the Super Duty using air-cooled Lycoming or Continental engines. The things that are different is the uh, inlet on the bottom for the radiator to get cool air directly into the radiator at uh, high angles of attack when the airplane is doing its best, which is short takeoff and landing flying. There's an opening for the gearbox to cool the gearbox, again, for a lot of power and slow flying. That can be tailored, it doesn't have to be quite that big. Um, also, it would be nice to add a little drain hole there underneath the gearbox in case you want to drain the gearbox oil without taking the cowling off. This inlet is used to feed an intercooler. The duct is out right now, but we'll talk about that. There's gonna be a duct right here and it goes right into the intercooler, which sits down inside here. The other side is just open and that's to bring a lot of air in and cool this general area where the hot parts for the turbocharger and the exhaust pipes are. The cowlings are held on with piano hinges. It's much easier to do on the Super Duty than other airplanes that we've worked on because it's completely straight, so no problem there. We use a, a three inch extension in order for the cowling and the spinner and everything to work out. So you would get a three inch extension for this one, which Viking has. And as you can tell, even the top line of the cowling comes out a little bit. It's not a straight shot. And again, that's the leftover of the light combing installation. The top cowling, it's very simple as well. It just goes on top of here. Um, again, just piano hinges. A lot of talk about that in our other installation videos. Nothing unique to the Super Duty. And a short piece of hinge up here keep the cowling from moving back and forth and lock it in about eight inches or so worth of hinge on the top there. And that's all there is to the cowling installation. It's very simple. You do have to, you know, formulate a, an inlet for the duct for the intercooler. And we'll talk about the intercooler installation next. So exactly how big of an intercooler do you need? Well, in racing circuits that allow turbochargers that question is always answered by as much as you have room for. And that's true. <clears throat> You're running a lot of boost and the cooler you can make the air coming out of the uh, engine run into the turbocharger um, or through the turbocharger, through the ducting and then into the engine, the more horsepower you're gonna make and you reduce the chance of detonation. Of course, the direct injected engine is kind of immune to detonation anyhow, but we wanna drop the air temperature as much as possible across the intercooler. And we'll talk about instrumentations and parameters of the engine later. The intercooler, if not already fitted to the engine when you received it, uh, uses two bolts down here, as you can see, that are used to bolt it to the engine itself. And then there's one bolt in the back. And that's what supports the intercooler to the engine right there. That one there is also used as an engine mounting. So you have to be careful of a couple of things if you take this apart. There is a spacer there, a black one behind. Then there's the engine mount itself. Then there's another spacer. And then the intercooler bracket mount, a washer, and a bolt. So that all goes into that same hole and this supports the back of the intercooler. So that's the basic physical mounting of the intercooler. <coughs> uh, we talked about in the other video that some intercoolers will have this elbow to get around this engine mount tube, newer installations will just have a tube coming right off of here. But in any case, there's gonna be an in and an out 
to the intercooler. Since we're on this side, let's look at the out, meaning to the engine. This is a very high grade silicone coupling that um, when installed will not fail on you. We've done a lot of thinking about how to make this turbo engine as safe as possible in airplanes. And just cobbling together with some imported parts and um, getting kind of elbows and fittings and stuff that are soft aluminum and that's not going to do in this kind of an installation. So everything has to be very precise and particular. This is a very high grade, like I said, coupling. Uh, you don't use just any kind of a clamp that you can find for or even a T-bolt clamp. These are also constant tension clamps. Uh, they are of a high grade stainless. They have the, you know, really good spot welds. They're of a really thick quality. So there are a lot of things like this that look the same when you buy it through racing shops and stuff and you don't want that. You wanna make sure that when you receive the engine and you receive a certain kind of clamp, that there's a reason for that. So if you ever replace it, replace it with the same quality. These clamps, uh, of course, this is already put together for you, but in any case, there's 45 inch pounds on these to tighten them up. And as you can see, it's a fairly fail safe system because the duct is in between the intercooler and the engine and it can't really go anywhere. And you will, will be seeing quite a bit of boost there. So that's one area that needs to be secure. Now, as far as uh, the output of the turbocharger that's on the other side of the engine, this has an inlet filter here, and then it comes back, and it goes through the turbocharger, and then it exits the turbocharger here. Again, good clamps. We use a 90 degree here. Another constant tension clamp there. And then it really just kind of drops down in the cowling here and goes, as you can see, across to the other side. And that's all there is to it. So really what I want to point out is just the quality of the clamps. And if you want to do any kind of maintenance on a yearly basis, um, it wouldn't hurt to remove all that, wash all the parts in soap and water, get all the oil out of it, inspect your clamps, uh, and then put it all back together. Because you don't want any of these ducts to come apart. All right, so that covers intercooler installation and we'll move into onto the battery installation in this particular airplane. Because we're kind of wired this whole thing as an open panel or no panel uh, system where you can put an iPad and move it around and you know put whatever you want here and move it around. We don't have a traditional instrument panel. So in this airplane, uh, in order to have a place to mount everything, uh, we had to also use the space that's available underneath the seats. So the passenger seat have the uh, batteries. We don't use these lithium batteries anymore. Uh, I don't like them, but we do have batteries, uh, aircraft style uh, batteries that we sell that are just a tiny bit heavier, but more uh, predictable than lithium. As you can see, we have fire extinguisher in here because we have lithium batteries in the cockpit or any kind of battery. So. Uh, but that's what we have. That's what we installed three years ago, and that's that's what's been in here. The uh, batteries are properly, obviously, held down. Um, things like getting the proper tools to put your lugs on is important. I've seen crimps that don't even have dimples in them, so you, you don't want anything like that. You want to make sure that, you know, cables can't separate from your battery, especially on an engine that requires electricity to run. Here you can see on the negative side, it's always nice to get a, a brass piece and and uh, make a grounding area and also tie the batteries together with that. And from there, we then, you know, tee off and go to our grounding buses and things like that. Um, you obviously don't want lots of screws like this with, with you know, grounding cable on top of grounding cable. These are just the three that go to the main uh, grounding buses throughout the aircraft. All right, so that's really just it for batteries. You got a little strap here to hold it down with a nut plate in two places to make it easy to, to remove. While we're on this side, um, we just made our own console. 
Looks a little messy, but basically a lot of excess wire that we didn't want to cut yet because we have um, uh, headset jacks and things like that that haven't been installed for the third seat back here. So that's what you're seeing laying down in here. But it's just a handy, you know, fold down panel in the console where you can go in and, and uh, get to your wiring. We also wired in some charging ports uh, on both sides and headset jacks right here. So, but that's not really engine related. What is engine related are like more up in here. We have our switches and we also sell switch panels now that are finished and can be bolted in somewhere in the airplane. Uh, but these are the essential things that you would keep your engine running, your master switches, which means the two switches that close the contactors. You know, they ground the contactor and this grounds the second contactor, which means that's what turns power onto the whole airplane. Uh, you can run one battery, the other battery, both batteries, and even no batteries for an emergency with the alternator on. Then you got individual pump switches for fuel pumps. And um, usually we would then put the alternator on this one. This actually has the alternator on the key switch, which has been changed up through the years. And so this needs to be replaced with that. But you'll see that in our more recent installation videos. So you put your alternator on a switch as well. And then of course this other stuff is, is uh, for lights and, and things like that. We do have a cool light on this uh, Super Duty, by the way. And that's this this guy right here. He really shines up the, the runway and people see us coming with that big light bar. Now, let's go to the other side and see what's underneath the other seat. And it's more of the individual wiring. All right, so we're on the other side. Um, first impression, even for me, that did this three years ago. A little bit messy, but... Uh, I just kind of looked at it and said, well, should I tie it up or whatever with tie wraps before I make a video? And and now really, it's it's kind of organized, even though it's um, <clears throat> might not look that way initially. I'm not trying to make excuses, but every wire is properly crimped. It has its proper location. The reason I didn't want to like start tying up all these bundles is because this is an airplane that, you know, up until this point, it's a test airplane. We add things. We, we're just now adding uh, uh, another gauge uh, to replace one. And it's just easy to follow the wiring if it's laid out, organized, but not all bundled down until, until you know, everything is finalized. But the main stuff in here is, um, you know, what you need is you kind of need a uh, some place for your avionics and some place for maybe engine-related stuff like fuel pumps and things. And you're going to need... So those are all fused, and then you're going to need a, a bus bar somewhere that actually is just connecting wires through for, uh, you know, for the tack and things like that. Some stuff that comes off the computer, and then you want to go from there somewhere else. And if you don't want to, like, twist wires together and solder, you need some place where you can just have a junction block to, to do that. And then the main contactors are here as well, which is then the input from... The batteries that are across the console over there uh, one positive to each contactor and then the outputs are tied together so you can use one or the other or both and then uh, we tee off with the wire that goes to power up the you know the main engine bus to provide um, power to the rest of the airplane um, this has actually covered a lot better in other videos, and of course you're going to be doing your own thing um, as far as wiring. Uh, you might not even do it underneath the seat. Uh, not everybody's going to be doing the unpanel design, but that's what we were faced with is uh, finding a space to do it, and we did. Uh, in order to then get through the console, you kind of have to put grommets in and come out here and go back in because... It's not really any room down inside there. Uh, <clears throat> there are cables running, there are control rods running, and of course you want to stay away from that for the wiring. Other things we got here, we got another charger thing, we got uh, the key switch, which I'm gonna move. Um, the, it's just hard to get to there. It's gonna be moved up here. And as far as avionics, we have <clears throat> you know a boost gauge, a manifold pressure, then we have our um, our Viking view gauge, 
uh, turn some power on, which uh, shows us a lot of things of the basics uh, when we're flying. The tack, uh, water, temp, oil, temp, which is gearbox temp. We don't actually read engine oil temp because it's always extremely low. We just read oil pressure. And, I, and then you got voltage, as you can see, the bottom left on the Viking views uh, flips in between. It normally would be fuel pressure, but if something is out of parameter, it toggles between the things that are out of parameter. And of course, oil pressure and voltage is out of parameter right now because the engine's not running. And we got a little radio, and we got a little transponder, and a little autopilot. So we have we have everything we need in here. Right now, um, I had a intercooler temp probe and I'm replacing it with a different one. And what I like about this uh, gauge is that it has um, two needles, a uh, green and a red. So you can read your intercooler before and after temperature on one gauge and compare the two. And of course, that's the whole idea with the intercooler is to see how efficient it is. So we have a probe coming in here to measure the, the hot side of the turbocharger. And then we're gonna see how much we can drop the temperature through the intercooler. And then we're gonna measure it and see how effective that is. And that is of course then related to how much air we can force through it and so forth and so on. So that's, um, that's really it. We're gonna also of course uh, talk about other things I want to talk about in the next video about the details of the engine everything that's on the engine in detail we might even cover like our baggage compartment down there um, so a lot to come and uh, but this was uh, the end of Viking turbo installation video number two